There we go. So yeah, now we're on to the main event. Uh, we do have a uh, email list and uh, uh, also Slack slash IRC. And IRC is actually hooked back up now that I remember to do it after we had a power outage. Yay. I really should move that to the cloud somewhere that's actually a data center rather than below my desk. But that's OK because it's a horribly written Python uh, uh, dumpster fire uh, partially using uh, multi-thready, partially using uh, features and promises. So because the two different libraries use two different uh, ways of communicating, and I didn't care enough to try and put them together. Sounds about right, prior to you, So Yeah. It, it, well, so the uh, uh, IRC actually uses uh, multi-threading, and the uh, uh, bulk uh, API for uh, Slack, uh, or uh, yeah, uh, uses uh, uh, futures and promises, the more modern way of Pythoning. So, uh, yeah, it's it's a mess. But you get to choose your own adventure, how you want to talk to us. There is, yeah, our website will say where we're at and what we're doing. I know we have a topic for next month. I haven't had a chance to look at it yet. And... Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be talking about that in the after uh, shenanigans here. But so the first part of our uh, double header uh, presentation here is uh, disks and file systems in Linux, a uh, brief overview of sort of stuff. And we'll see just exactly how big of a mess this ends up being between the two of us, because there there was lots of coordination that happened. Yes. Here. <laughs> so yeah, if I start to talk about something that you're going to cover, just I'm in from System D, so awesome. <laughs> I'm completely not System D, so we're we're great. Uh, but yeah, about me, I've been a Linux user since 2003. Somehow I maintain being not only a member, but the president here. Someone can <laughs> someone can put me out of my misery at any point. We'll have a uh, Thunderdome and uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I have a website. And uh, otherwise, by day, I program computers. And by night, I still program computers. I really need to go to sleep <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so that's me. And I mean, any chance to use my head headshot uh, is a, uh, a good time to put it in a slide deck here. But yeah, the intro, disks have been around for a long time. And uh, yeah, uh, they, they've gone from uh, really, really big washing machines all the way now to uh, smaller stuff. And we'll try and touch on a little bit of the tech along the way. But I'm not going to dwell on a lot of stuff because some of this is just so arcane that it's not really useful. And or it's dealing with hardware stuff. And I'm a software kind of guy. So, <laughs> so yeah, you're parts of a, a normal spinning rust hard disk. You've got a whole bunch of platters that spin really, really fast. An actuator arm moves across it. And the where it is on the disk, you actually care about because stuff at the center spins faster than stuff on the outside uh, for disk access and reading and all that sort of stuff. Back in the day, you'd have to defrag it, and it was a lot of work. But the good thing is with this, uh, as we'll find out in a couple of the file systems, it really matters, especially in like journals and stuff like that. When you're uh, writing stuff a lot and it's a really chatty file system. This is great because when you wear out a piece of spinning rust, that's impressive. It, it takes some work. You can do it, but oof. Now the next, wow, that is really grainy. That's what I get for pulling images off the internet. The sort of next generation of stuff is solid state drives, and they're all based off of flash memory. And these do have they're supposed to have built in, especially if you have a good one, wear leveling where it will balance out where you're writing so that you don't wear a hold in one spot. You just sort of spread your wear across everything. And in theory, you should be fine. But especially if you're using it as scratch space or uh, uh, virtual RAM or stuff like that, you're going to have a bad time. And especially depending on what file systems you have. Uh, 
if it's a really chatty one that's journaling a lot and uh, doing cow, uh, which we'll cover here in a minute, uh, it's going to cause a lot more wear on your drive and it will burn out a lot faster. So it matters. But SSDs, the great thing is they are solid state and they are fast. And if you're still using spinning rust and doing anything more than just study, uh, storing a whole bunch of files that are like long-term sort of stuff, you're going to have a bad time. Upgrade to SSD, you'll be a lot happier. Or just use old tech like me and, yeah, it's that. Uh, and then the other thing to remember is uh, old tech never really dies, it just mutates. And the, the key note here is uh, everyone's used and heard R files. Well, that, that tech is from the tape drive. And even still, if you need to back up a bunch of stuff and you're in a big data center or using Amazon Glacier, which they, they don't say that it's tape, but it's tape, uh, they, you're going to uh, still be storing your stuff on tape. And of course, the old joke of never underestimate the bandwidth of a uh, station wagon full of uh, <laughs> tapes driving down the highway. That's still, still applicable today. It's a new tape. Yes. <laughs> yes. And of course, tapes have gotten better. They're bigger. But you can, if you need to throw a few terabytes in one spot and have a robot move them around, it, it's really cool. You can see robots that take up a whole uh, row in a data center and it just plugs and moves stuff. And yeah, I, that's way out of scope for the stuff that we're, we're going to talk about, though. On to something a little bit more applicable. Uh, we're going to go through a few uh, sort of just base things that you're going to hear about. I know it's our, if we're starting at the beginning, yeah, I'm sure you've heard of uh, a disk running out of iNodes before because you have a whole bunch of little files and you have to turn up the, how many iNodes are allocated and reserved and stuff like that. And so what is iNode? It's basically, uh, it's short for an index node. It's the uh, fundamental data structure in the Linux file system. Basically, it's the... Did yes. We start, did we start recording? We have. Okay, cool. Uh, it's basically the fundamental structure that is the building block that all of the information about your files and directories are there, except for oddly enough, the file name. Uh, <laughs> so it has the metadata around your disk, your file. Uh, so it has like how big it is, what sort of permissions are there? Uh, can root only read it? Is it read only? Those sort of stuff. Who owns it? Uh, what time it was written, which will end up being a thing that will play into some of these file systems because uh, the uh, upcoming Linux, uh, Y, what is it, Y238? Yes, 238. Yeah, yeah. We, which we'll, we'll cover here in a few minutes, but that, that timestamp and how big it is will matter. And then also it will point to uh, a list of addresses where uh, the, the actual data is stored. And you'll have uh, things like, okay, I have just a really small, uh, apologies for the people on, on the uh, phone line here, you won't see my, my motions, I guess. Here, I, I can move the mouse over it, uh, but you, you can have direct files that are really small where it just points to uh, a limited number of blocks of data. You can have things such as a single indirect, which points to another set of inodes that have the list of data. Or you can have a, a double or triple indirect where you get into really big blocks of data. And the thing is, all of these can be scattered across the disk, depending on how the file system works and how things want to be allocated. But the, this is basically the fundamental unit that keeps track of where all of your data is on the, the disk. And uh, th this, of course, is a uh, simplified version of what it looks like, but essentially there is a little bit of difference depending on what file system you have as well. Let me scroll down my notes here so that I'm... Uh, and other things that you care about is what I know number it is. Uh, that's something that you can find actually in the, the file system. 
Uh, and uh, yeah, everything else, I think I've gotten here. Uh, yep, and we'll go through some of the commands here in the, the end, but uh, the, the, of note, there is the uh, uh, ls uh, the ls dash i uh, disk pre dash i will tell you how many i nodes are left ls will tell you dash i will tell you which i nodes each of the things are in that directory and then if you want to find a certain i node to see if any files are being used you can do dash i num or find slash so start at the root uh, and dash inum and the number of the inode you're looking for. And where that comes into play is uh, different files can point to the same inode and be the same exact file, even though they're different file names. And if you change it in one, it, because it is the same, it will change in the same. And so that can be great, especially if you're deduplicating stuff. That, that's sort of a poor man's way of deduplicating things. So we talked about file names. How, how do we actually get the file names since we have an item? Essentially, I couldn't put it any better than what uh, Wikipedia did, but uh, basically you have the directory and in there, um, it, uh, each entry in there attaches to an inode, which then of course attaches to all the other, I you get the point. Uh, and to find a file, basically, you start at the top and you work your way down. Depending on how, what file system you're using, some of them list them in B trees, and that's faster, but it also take up more memory. We'll get to those in a minute. But basically, the, the big thing to remember is the root directory at the top of the disk is always stored at item number two. The file system can find it by at mount point at mount time, and then from there, basically, it's just. Uh, walking all the way down. The, the big thing to remember also is that there are a couple special directories uh, in their period, which is the current directory, and uh, uh, dot dot, which is the parent directory, and they actually literally are stored as period and double period in the directory, and those I know to basically think of it as like a linked list where you can traverse the, the entire file system forward and backward by just following those. Uh, the, the big thing to remember is also you can't delete those two because otherwise very bad things happen and your file system will hate you. Uh, the other big thing that you'll hear talked about is journals. Basically what happens is you write to disk and then you write the metadata well, the journals, uh, basically, you, you write stuff first to the journal, then you write the data, then you write, write the metadata. So what happens is if the power goes out, you have the metadata saved in the journal before it's actually stored, uh, actually, in the, the actual file system itself. So you sort of have a belt and suspenders way of protecting yourself so that because if you unplug your computer while it's writing, <laughs> data will be lost. Uh, now, the question is, how bad is it, and is it lost in a way that's going to completely corrupt your file system? Depending on the file system, maybe. Most of those file systems we've gotten rid of, though. Uh, and uh, one of the ways that you can fix, uh, and it basically replaces the, the journal as you start up, you can run uh, E2 file check, uh, and it will play over your unmounted uh, disk. Uh, the two of the big famous uh, file systems that have journaling, XT3 was sort of the one of the first ones in the Linux space that, that was uh, sort of the, the mainline sort of use stuff. We'll, we'll go into a little more history here in a bit, but it was a little bit slow and uh, didn't perform nearly as well as XT4, which is now the standard. We'll dive into the pros and cons here in a minute. Uh, other tools that you care about, FDisk will format. Uh, 
it and manipulate the, your partitions so you can have chunks of a disk in different file systems. Like say, if you want to have part of it be a scratch drive, part of it be your home drive, and the rest of your disk, that way if you blow away and reinstall your OS, your home still is pristine and you don't lose all your files if you're keeping your, your stuff that you care about there, that sort of stuff. Uh, DF is uh, how, how much uh, disk space is free, DU is disk usage, and then you can also do things with a smart control to see the health of your, your hard disk. I'm going to spin through this pretty quickly so that uh, I don't uh, shortchange Matt here. But uh, we, we can spend an entire whole presentation on the use and tearing up of these. So the old file systems, XT2, if you have a really old copy of Linux, that's the default. The problem is it's sort of like uh, uh, FAT32. It uh, doesn't have any journaling. And uh, it, it really is a old dinosaur of a system. But it, is a bit backwards compatible. If you bring it into like an XT3 or an XT4 uh, driver, it can mount it, everything's fine, and it, it works. Uh, XT3 added journaling. Uh, if you didn't have one specific edge case of uh, file system stuff, it was completely backwards for uh, compatible. So you could have an XT3 file system walk over to a computer that only had XT2 drivers and it would work, and everything would be fine most of the time. Uh, there were some major performance issues, so especially with the uh, way that the journaling was handled, uh, that uh, sort of led to XT4 coming about. We'll talk about him in a little bit. And then there was the old IBM journal file system. It was very stable, but it also really didn't have many of the nice features. And if you were going to go through all the trouble of using that, you should probably use XFS or one of the uh, ButterFS or one of those because uh, it has a lot better features and it's actually being fully, really maintained. But it's stable as heck and still may run into it. And then there's dead file system, RiserFS. <laughs> Uh, so, a little, little side joke for those who uh, may not know uh, the freighter of the Riser uh, file system, Hans Riser, uh, is also a convicted murderer. And that's part of the reason why it's no longer being updated because the primary uh, maintainer is uh, now making license plates instead of file systems. So, yeah, a very sad thing, but. Here we are. It was a note because it was using B plus uh, data tree structures, which uh, helped with speed. Uh, it was also using file allocation by bitmap, so uh, it was uh, sort of creating out how the files were created that way. Uh, it also was one of the, the first ones that you could use insanely large amounts of disk space if you had a disk that's big. So you could have uh, 16 tibby bytes worth of uh, files and one ex exit byte uh, worth of uh, or swap bit. You could have volumes up to 16 tibby bytes and a max file of one exabyte, which is, if you have files that big, you have a lot bigger pocket than I do. <laughs> But that's going to be sort of a, a theme of a lot of these are as time went on, the disk availability just got bigger and bigger. Uh, it's now marked uh, obsolete and will be removed in 2025 if uh, no one comes up with a really compelling argument why they shouldn't from the kernel. And it also is no longer being maintained and it suffers the Y2K38 problem where basically the uh, uh, the epoch time from uh, 1970, whatever, when it was. January 1st, 1970. Yeah. UDC got it. Uh, yeah, it's uh, the, the file times are stored in ticks and uh, there's uh, only so many uh, seconds in a 32-bit number and on that date, will cross that threshold and it cycles back down and <laughs> that thing's happy and it's Y2K all over again, the line will lay with the lamb and yeah, oh, that thing's happy. But, but this time it's actually real. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, though, 
if anything, that's a good argument why you shouldn't use it. Uh, but th there are also really old file systems that not, not just Linux use. Uh, if you have a thumb drive, odds are, especially if it's a cheap small one, it's probably FAT32. Uh, pretty much everyone can talk that, even your camera, your uh, everything. Your soundboard. <laughs> yeah. It's simple. Uh, it is a little redundant. There's two copies of the, the file uh, table. Uh, of course, yeah, that brings up the problem of what happens when I have two watches. I never know what time it is. Uh, it's also unorganized. Uh, they, there is no such thing as defragging. It, basically, you just get the next chunk of file that's free. You, you can go back through and re defrag it, but basically, there is no thought to it. It's just pure chaos. And if you have a bunch of small files and bigger ones and et cetera, you're playing Tetris and Jenga, and that, that can cause issues. And also, the thing that drives me nuts is files are limited to a size of four gigabytes. And uh, that, that actually hurts things when you use uh, uh, big videos and stuff like that. There's a lot of stuff, a lot of products that use it. You got to find a little glove and they just, every four gigabytes, they just chunk the files. <laughs> And so uh, the, the big thing about this is that uh, it is patent unencumbered. So uh, that's why everyone uses it, because it is completely free. And uh, it's also from way, way, way back in like the Dark Ages. And before that, it was Bat 16, which was even smaller than that. And yeah. So on to the modern file systems here. Uh, XT4, it has journaling, it's fast, it's, it supports large files, and I realized that I uh, tabbed everything over after large file. Uh, those two, first two things should be tabbed, but everything else slides back over, yay. Uh, so yeah, big disk sort of stuff, uh, depending on your uh, file system, you can either go from 16 KB bytes to 256. And uh, volume size, you're up into the exabytes, which again, is just mind-blowingly large. You're spending a lot of money on disks. Uh, it does allow for extents, which uh, basically are uh, a different way of storing the files, if, if I remember right. Uh, and uh, other important things, it has delayed allocation, which is another thing that RiserFS was great for. You don't write the disk until you need it, and that, that saves time and space. Uh, you have some indexing of your directory so you can search stuff. And it's also amazingly backwards compatible with the XT2 and 3. So if you plug in a XT2 drive into your machine that only has XT4 drivers, it will chug along just fine. Uh, and you, uh, they've also uh, taken care of the time from good until far past my lifetime of uh, 2446 if man is still alive. Yeah, sounds like around for like future generations. Yeah, that, that's future us from. Uh, XFS, it's all the way back to 1993. So it's an old one, but it's still modern. Uh, SGI IRIX, uh, uh, originally was uh, uh, creating it. Uh, it is the 64-bit uh, file system originally. It has journaling, can go up to eight exabytes, uh, and you can uh, divide your disk up into allocation groups, and then it can also strike it across those. So it's blazingly fast and amazing, sort of think like grade zero-ish sort of idea. Um, Again, you have B plus and trees sort of like riser. Uh, and uh, it is it has extended attributes you can have online defragmentation so you can defrag it without having to unmount it, which is great. It is also default with Red Hat. It is. But I will love there is one access to that, so you can't shrink it. Yep, which is the next part of this here, the downsides. Memory use is higher because of that B plus tree. Uh, you can't shrink it. You can only grow the file system out. So if you add more disk, great, you can grow it out. But if you decide, hey, you know, I, I want to uh, downsize uh, 
grandma's photo collection to because grandma's not taking many photos anymore and i need to allocate it to photo uh, drive for photos of uh, little timmy but too bad you can't create a new disc and move stuff around but that, that's really all you can do uh, it, it's also uh, there's less advanced tooling it's not nearly as uh, good at fixing stuff as e2fsck uh, mostly just because less people are really kind of using it. Red Hat sort of on their own out there. And the main reason why is speed, I think, is the main reason why it's yep. used. Yeah, speed matters, but uh, you also can't disable journaling, which is really bad for flashware because your journal can wear a hole in your flash if you're not careful. Uh, the metadata uh, stuff that it, it does there causes deletion of large files to be slow, a large number of files to be slower. And uh, there is not sort of checksums or stuff like that built into it. So bit rot will result in uh, data loss. It's also really bad at storing a bunch of small files. But hey, we only have large files here, so that's great. Uh, ButterFS has a uh, copy on write. So basically it will if you have a change, it will uh, keep the old one, write the new one, and then delete the old one. So that, that's both a plus and a minus. You can have snapshots, subvolumes. It's great for taking backups and stuff like that. It has checksums built in, so it can detect data corruption a lot more easy. It has built-in compression, which is sort of like NTFS. Uh, but a little actually more actually useful this time. Yeah, it's actually good compression because it's uh, Zlib, LZO, and Z standard. So that that's great. Uh, you you can actually have uh, built-in and baked-in RAID, which is a good and a bad thing. They still advise RAID is somewhat unstable and should be used in production. Uh, uh, as for ten years. Yeah. yeah. Yes, and it will never be fixed, you're right, especially for RAID 5 and 6. Basically, they're saying, don't use it, even though it, it's there. I think one of the RAID 1 better best works fine enough. Is there yep. works fine enough. Anything more advanced, uh, here be dragons, our data, our data will be gone, and we will be sad. Yeah. And don't talk to me that way. <laughs> yep, make sure you have good backups. Uh, so they're a corruption tool, so uh, yeah. Uh, you can do uh, dynamic inode allocation instead of the fixed, like some of the other file systems are. So you, you can basically create additional inodes as you need them, is my understanding of it. So that's great. Uh, you can also do that uh, defragmentation while in use, which is, again is great. And it's 16 exabytes worth of uh, fi files and file systems. So you could have just one really, really big file on your, your file system if it's okay, which is just crazy, but here we are. Uh, and yeah, so it has cool advanced stuff like that. Uh, the downsides or advanced features are that it's really good at packing in small files. It supports uh, SSD optimization and it can handle deduplication. The downsides. RAID, like I talked about, fragmentation can be an issue. You'll probably need to go through and defrag your stuff periodically, where some of the other file systems aren't nearly so bad about that. Uh, encryption is not at file level. You can do, of course, file uh, blocks. Yeah. So th there are other tools you can get around it. The corruption tools aren't really good at checking things. But hey, with the uh, checksums, that's less of an issue. Uh, performance overhead with all of those cool things like cow and deduplication and checksum, you're going to kill some CPU cycles there. And also, there, some of the stuff is still experimental and will always be experimental. I'm playing an unreal feature bus. It's free space management. It's got better than it used to, but it's free space management. It's so weird. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't like using it, but I think my NAS actually uses it under the, the hood. So, yeah, I've been moving off it for the past. Over eight years and it's been fine. As long as I don't run out of disk space, then yeah. it's fine. I mean, I, I'm lazy. I admit I use XT4 just because that's the default. But uh, ZFS. I assume it's Synology. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I have a yeah. Synology client clone, but. But we're not detecting it, it's better FS. Yep. Yeah. 
quite evolved. So that's like the only difference. Uh, I think Sue does too. Yeah. Okay. So again, another really simple one, ZFS. Awesome name because it's the Zettabyte file system originally from uh, Sun. Now it's OpenZFS because everyone hates Sun and Sun, yeah. Uh, <laughs> data uh, clarity, you have checksums and cow. Uh, you have full storage where you pull your disks together and can separate stuff out. Uh, you have dynamic striping again, so you have really fast writes to chunks. So you get essentially the benefit of a RAID 0 or RAID 1 without uh, actually uh, it, it just is handled by the file system. Uh, you can have just obscenely large sizes of disks again. Uh, Gobi bytes. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Basically, it's big enough to say, just don't worry. Uh, it has RAID support, compression, and deduplication on the fly, and it has transparent encryption. Downside, it's very complex, and the increase, increased uh, complexity will hurt you if you don't need it, uh, including CPU and memory increased usage. It's and also all your <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's uh, very inflexible in how you can expand your pool. You you can't really expand it. You only just pop out the disk and pop in a new one, and it's a larger disk, so you're good to go. Uh, and data loss is bad, a bad thing. If even one wow. virtual device in your uh, pool ends up failing, it probably will hurt your entire disk and you'll lose data. So backups are important. Uh, lots of I.O. overhead, especially with the cow and all that stuff. So it uses more power. So especially if you're in a power constrained space like a laptop or something like that, it's going to suck. Uh, it, can't reallocate bad sectors, so there's some problems with that. And also, over USB, the performance is terrible for some reason. If you need multiple desks, don't use, don't use hardware array, use this. Yeah. Uh, so then uh, the solution to FAT32 is, of course, XFAT. Uh, it came about in 2006 for USB and SD cards. It can handle really large files. Uh, it can handle disks up to 128 petabytes, although they really, really strongly encourage you only to use 512 terabytes. Uh, you can have an insane large number of files per directory. It's fairly cross compatible. Most modern things will be able to handle it ish, but it is patent encumbered. Uh, it is simple for low powered devices and it's easy. And it's default file system uh, officially for SDXC cards, uh, so those little flash cards. Uh, but with that being said, I only know of a few that have ever actually been formatted with it because no one follows the standard. Uh, it's not as compatible as FAT32. There's still no journal, so you, you still have that data loss risk. And it doesn't have any of the cool features like shadow copies, encryption, compression that we'll talk about here in a second with the other non Linux uh, file system. Uh, recovery is far tougher and more complex without that metadata structure of all those other nice things. Apologies there. Uh, allergies are just going nuts here. Uh, but uh, and then, of course, the, the old Windows granddaddy of them all, NTFS. It's the new technology file system. It came about during Windows NT 3.1. So it's been around for a long time, too, which is why the compression in it sucks. Uh, it does have journaling. There's uh, Apple's and BitLocker uh, encryption uh, and uh, file level, level permission sort of stuff. Uh, you can have largish files of uh, volumes of eight petabytes. Should be enough for a Windows computer. I don't know it can count that high. Anyway. Uh, you can do all sorts of cool stuff that you can do in Linux, uh, just in slightly different ways with hard links, uh, disk quotas, uh, and uh, reparse points, which is how they do symlinks. It does have a form of compression. It's terrible. It's not very compatible with for it. Yeah, it's bad, and you should feel bad for considering using it. Just get a bigger disk. 
Um, it is supposedly highest performance. Okay. I mean, it's, okay. it's our case. Yeah. And it's reliable and they have pretty good tooling around healing. So it, it can recover fairly well, even if your window, your Linux file system uh, drivers totally mess up it, you boot into Windows and it usually can recover itself fairly well. Drawbacks, the journaling is not really targeted at saving your files. It's more saving your metadata. So data loss is less of their concern. <laughs> uh, performance is not great around large files. Data corruption and bit rot is a concern for long-term storage with it, which is a lot of the other file systems too. They're not great for long-term storage. Uh, and it's not nearly as flexible as ButterFS or ZFS, and it's definitely not as scalable as ZFS. So I think in the interest of time here, I'll hand it over to uh, uh, Matt here for the, the second part. And if I can turn off my screen sharing. Uh, it's easy to notice. It isn't as nice to like Google. I can just like, well, who can look for that wants that? Okay, I will share mine. And I think it's all because I'm actually the, the host of it. So it's keeping other users from clawing it away from me. Cool. All right, we'll talk about how replacing open the units, how you're probably using SMD for all of your files stuff on the Linux community. So we'll briefly breeze over what SystemD is, and we'll kind of go through the replacements of how you're replacing common Unix stuff with SystemD, and I'll briefly glance over some management of Unix. So SystemD describes itself as a system and service manager from the footnotes on the system side of it in the part of the doc. What about SystemD resolve data? I don't have that. We're not going to talk about that today. So from SystemD, a unit is a plain text INI file that a code information about. They listed everything they manage, controlled by the best SystemD. There's lots of things they control. What does INI file look like? Well, there's typically three sections. They, you have a unit, which gives the description, dependency controls. So you can kind of say, hey, I only want my unit to start when I have network, for example. The do want fails. So you can say, hey, if my unit fails, call this other unit. Like, send an email or send a message off to go tell you that something failed. And a bunch of other configuration options, go check your net pages. Install, this kind of just tells how the enable the table commands to work. And then you have the text section. So the service, the socket, or the mount, or the auto mount, or the timer, the cron, um, things like that. Services, you probably already know this. System you manage the services. You can also manage the activation of sockets. Let's say you have a website, if you only want to have run when, it can, when I, people connect to it, you can use socket. As soon as the system needs gets a connection to that socket, go to running service. Kind of cool. You can place cron of system D. Um, so instead of uh, you know the cron thing, you can use system D's fun little format here. Nice for you by time zones and so, you know, timers when any of the conditions are met, it will run. So this one will run. Every Wednesday at 4 a.m. America Chicago time and 30 seconds after boot. Here's some examples of the format. You can say, you know, different range of dates and like human readable format, or you can just say annually, which will be probably midnight on January 1st. Um, if you want to know when it will run, you can give the thing to system be analyzed and it'll tell you when it runs. Nice. It's kind of cool. That's nice. <laughs> All right, now we're ta now talking about back onto like disks. So we're kind of talking about how expanding and replacing SES tab. Um, so there's a few different units here. Half is kind of related, but we don't throw it in. So mount is like describes how you would mount a file system. We we'll call the mount options, what device it has, where you know where you want it mounted. Automatically, automatically mount a file system with a path that you use. So if you have a NFS share and you only want to mount it when people are using it. You can have system just automatically mount the file system as soon as someone uses it. And then you can say, like, you know, so many seconds, you can have it unmount. And then tab. So if you have uh, some tab where you say, like, every time this file gets touched, it'll call another unit to update, which is to like run a service. Let's say you want to run a process every single time a file gets changed, like a Dropbox type thing of, oh, there's a new file to process. You can use system D for that. 
That's nice. Usually when you use that. So important about uh, auto mounts and modifying the system D, you need to match everything. So if you wanted to auto mount bar log audits, whenever that was touched, you wanted to auto mount and that thing mount, your auto mount file and your mount file need to be doing the same thing. And a second note is that if you say, hey, I'm going to find the same mount point in SCD F tab and in, in the file tab and in the system D, system D doesn't care about SCF tab. It just doesn't care. It won't read the options. It only cares about what it says. How do you create them? Um, you could read the man page and do it yourself, or you can send to just do it for you. So you can just say, here are the mount options. I want it to automatically mount. And then there's where, where it lives, and there's where it will go. Then you just copy it to some more permanent location than the one partition. And then you want to enable that mount unit on boot. Because it's just like a sort of think, think of it just like a service. If you want to you know, sort of service, you'd enable it. It's the same thing. And so there's an example of a, uh, if you want to mount an FS chair. So it's, and then notice how it's served data and that's where I'm mounting it. That has to match. If it doesn't, the system will get mad at you and won't mount it. And if I remember correctly, the errors it gives are the exact same when it does that, of course. <laughs> So auto mounts is kind of like you mount to some other access. I'll say this again, this is not auto mount on boot. This is, can be confusing, but that's kind of what it is. I like to report it must a mounting mount unit must exist. If you have dependencies like, oh, I really want my NFS mount when I have network, put the on the mount unit, that'll be auto mount. Um, you put it on both, you can get fun conflicts, triple dependencies. It's bad. And with if you use auto mount, you would not you would disable not automatically mount mount, but then enable the auto mount to run. Because remember, enable enable is just like a think of just like a service um, for that. And there's an auto mount. It's actually really simple. You just say where it is, and then system do it. Link everything up for you behind. So I mentioned kind of previous before. Um, they're probably using it right now. So there's a service called system the SAF set generator. So early in the boot process, system D will read this and just <laughs> automatically create system D map units for you. <laughs> so if you have a Linux box, I would run this command. I'll, I'll say a second here. Um, since the mount is named after the file system, the root mount is really named just dash. Is the name of the unit. So yeah, so there you go. I checked this with both uh, Realm 9 and Netflix to Boot to both do this. So there's the fun there. You also can configure swap. Um, obviously, it's need done if you prefer FCS yes, tab, but you want to do it in a system V system, you also can create notes to need a swap. And also relatively simple, I pull this off with a uh, this is the swap on my Linux on my Ubuntu box. This is the automatically generated one. But if you create it around, it'll look pretty similar. Talk about targets briefly. Um, just kind of the system D management side of the talk. Um, targets are like a spot where you can say, hey, all these units are finished. I want to make this as a like a checkpoint of everything finished. Um, pretty useful startup. So you can say, hey, the network started, or hey, all the Files are loaded, things like that. So you can place run level targets. Um, graphical dot target. So if you're running a full box, that would be from run level like one five. Three, you want to do target. Save and select NVIDIA drivers. You don't want your graphics vendor to start. That's the way you can do it. I've got the command to do it. Having around, I saw these run level different. Uh, misspelled it there. Some run level targets. Kind of like this, but I haven't tested those yet, so your mileage may vary. Other useful targets, so you can say network online. Um, this system is actually rather nice. You can see status, start tapping around, and um, should be able to do it. Another fun fact is users can have their own services. Um, it's a common path that's there. Um, I'll show in a couple slides where you can see where there's all the files that we will look. An important note, how long those run after you log out, or if they run at all, is kind of things under system D, log in D settings, system D. There's some weird ways to handle the way it runs processes for you. 
as a user that if you log out, sometimes those can get killed. Makes uh, TMUX real fun sometimes when you just have SSH. They wonder why, why, my, why where did my TMUX go after I logged out? And log in the email, just fit around and just happily kill out. So helpful. Yes. So once again, our, our, our friend system the analyze, it's actually a surprisingly useful command. It tells you all sorts of things about your install system D. Every dist distro is a little bit different. So kind of using this one kind of help you figure out what your system is doing. And this is important. Now, this is a ordered list. So set to the top will over the top. So you put, let's say, you know, Nginx, for example. If you have Nginx right about the system, and you say, oh, I have my own system unit, you put it in Etsy, your system D service will put in. And there's one for the user. You can kind of see there's a lot of apps where those the user can put the uh, services. So talk about overriding. So let's say you just want to change like the description of Nginx. You can do drop in files um, in that path there. And then just create a .com file and just say, I want to override the unit in this key. Let's override that key. If you create the actual unit and it doesn't override the whole thing, um, which may or may not what you want to do, but don't just, don't, don't just create the unit you want to overwrite, just one thing. And there are some useful commands. There's some I have some, I have a link to the slide too, if you want to take a look at them later. Can simply cat config is kind of useful if you want to like say, hey, tell me. Like, show me the config file that you think you're saying um, for this unit or for this part of SMD. Kind of quick, but there are some fun things you can do with SystemD. Okay, so, yeah. Hey, that looks familiar. Yes, oh, I, I, I stole some of that idea. I don't like it. <laughs> yours, the, yours is even clearer than mine. <laughs> okay. Uh, questions, comments, snag remarks? This one is eating up. <laughs> uh, I do see Jordan uh, was mentioning the uh, AI generated code in the uh, background of one of my uh, slides. <laughs> Looked very uh, Lisp like, but it had, yeah, had some very important. interesting syntax features. <laughs> like, lots of double parentheses. I think I saw like a plus parentheses minus so maybe some postfix <laughs> operators. I don't know what's going yeah. on. I, I definitely asked for some, some of the stuff was like, give me a uh, abstract image. Uh, Illustrating butter of mess <laughs> with, with tucks in it. I mean, that sounds like weird syntax choices to me. So, yeah. What on earth was the syntax for the FAT32 old robot? Oh, uh, <laughs> that, that was uh, give me a old, uh, well, let's see here. I think it was give, give me an old Android. Uh, with uh, cobwebs and or a geriatric android with a, a board cute with cobwebs on it. <laughs> <laughs> and of the options that came back with that, that was just the, the most awesome looking. <laughs> So for the the penguin for that used for the butterfs slide was the prompt for that something like give me give me a tux seriously reconsidering his life choices after RM <laughs> RFing his entire hard drive like he had that kind of dead cold thousand yard stare going on you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> there are some interesting ones uh, let's see here if we hop back to the the images of shame here. There we go. Uh, yeah, so here's the, the board one. And uh, let's see. We're not seeing anything on the screen. Oh. As I realized, I'm, I'm showing to everyone else, <laughs> but uh, not to you guys. So here, uh, but 
<laughs> and now you can pop Zoom to do the other screen. Switch. Okay. So then bringing the mouse back over here and going full sized. There we go. So, yeah, it, let's see, what was it? Uh, <laughs> oh, the toast yeah, that's, that's, that's the face of someone who just deleted the wrong partition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, this, this one I'm going to put out. He's totally high as a kind. <laughs> It wasn't the all of his friend that ultimately yeah. really tries the FS. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm surprised it actually got the text right on this one. It did? It, it, I, I, it, it got it twice on the list. Yeah. Uh, Are you still recording? Yeah, we should probably hit. Uh, back to the least trim. Uh, where did they put it on? Just there we go. We want to stop a 